and we had uh, three breakout questions. What is the thesis of the text? Um, what is the cultural bomb and what are the effects of the cultural bomb? And then what are your questions about the text? Uh, who would like to start us off? Um, I could start. Um, so I would say like the thesis um, is just um, the text is like discussing how um, like the impacts of colonialism and imperialism left like um, well changed African society, especially like with their language and how um, that, you know, colonialism um, brought like new languages to Africa. And so now um, the African people are struggling to find um ways to still like incorporate their history and their like heritage into a language that's not their mother tongue. Perfect. Thank you. Did anyone else want to add to that thesis? Okay. Uh what are the go ahead sorry, go ahead Ernesto. Um so the first thing I was thinking about was I was thinking about how um back I think I want to say in elementary middle school. Okay. I remember learning about something called the Cars Carso Indian School or some sort of where I'm not too sure and I tried searching it up in the amount of time I had. But I remember reading about something about how Native Americans would go and the saying was something like um kill the native but save the man. And what they would do is they would have Native Americans inside these boarding like homes and just keep them out of the sun, keep them out of light, because the longer someone was inside, the more pale someone got. So they would turn more pale and they would learn the Christian religion and other such sort. And yeah, I just wanted to make the connection because before I forget it. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, connection, Ernesto. And also... Um is a great example of, an, of, of analysis, right? So you were able to help make sense of what Ngugi is arguing about your previous knowledge based off what the um, indigenous folks went through in the native schools, sorry, not the native schools, the missionary schools and the boarding schools and things of that nature. So absolutely, and yes, you're absolutely right. Um, that notion of um, kill the Indian, save the man was very prevalent in the way that the, um, European conquerors came and engaged the 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 indigenous folks of this land. So that, that's a great call out. Um, and I think also that's a great segue into the second question, right? Um, what is the cultural bomb and what are the effects of the cultural bomb? Uh, go ahead, Kevin. So cultural bomb is kind of like, it's kind of like forcing, not forcing, but kind of like pushing someone else's culture something another culture onto someone else's culture kind of like erasing it so for example like i'm mexican and i love my culture and being in the u.s you're kind of like pushed into like that like usa fourth of july hot dogs hamburgers kind of thing and there's like a little bit of culture there but like how it relates to the text is kind of like they're getting like westernized and it's kind of like feels like they're being like pushed to a corner and they don't have their like culture with them because they're like being forced into a different culture. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like an analogy where you get kicked into the deep end of the pool and you're like drowning. Mm, I like that. Um, and and what I was listening, as I was listening to you, the notes that I wrote was like a forced assimilation, right? Like you're being forced to assimilate without your will or without your agency. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. Um, what, then with that being said, um, what are the effects of the cultural bomb? And you spoke to it in, in a roundabout way, Kevin, um, but but what does Ngugi says is the effects of the cultural bomb? It kind of like, um, it kind of like annihilates their like beliefs of their names, their languages, the environment, heritage, etc. And it kind of like basically just erases their culture in kind of like a way. Yep, I think that's just spot on. He said it, it annihilates their beliefs, right, in their culture, in their language, in their names, right? So you don't see that as value, right? Um, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit more um, as I get into my lecture. Uh, who would like to talk about any questions that they may have had about the reading? 
And again, this is from the fourth component of your journal. So we should all have some type of questions if you're able to do your journal. No questions? I kind of have like a semi a little small question. Sure. Uh, whenever they talk about like the intended results are despair, despondency, and the collective death wish, it like it kind of like made me question a little bit like what like how bad was it to where they needed to like collective death wish? Like, oh please kill me now. This is terrible. Um that's a good question. Um and it's a couple of ways to approach it, but what I'm thinking about is um, this phenomenon of, and, and Toni Morrison writes about this in, in her novel, Beloved, right? Where this this phenomenon of um, African people either A, throwing their babies overboard, right? On, while they're on the um, enslavement ships, on their way, on the Middle Passage, on their way to the Americas, right? Um, throwing their babies overboard to avoid with the perceived danger of what's to come or throwing themselves overboard to perceive, to, to avoid the perceived danger of what's to come. Um, so I think that kind of speaks to, in a way, how bad it was, you know? Um, I think also the unknown within itself speaks to how bad it was. Um, did, I, did I tell you guys about my um, experience when I went to Ghana and we went to the, the dungeons in Cape Coast? So I, 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 this, I think, will also help you understand um, how bad it was. So last fall, um, I was able to go to Ghana, um, Cape, Cape Coast, Ghana, um, West Africa, and it was for an educational summit. And one of the first things that we did um, which I, I I disagreed with. I was on the like the planning committee for the trip, and I didn't really want that. The first thing that we did was to go to these slave dungeons, right? Um, but you know they they saw it fit, so this is what we do. And when I tell you, um, the moment that I set foot just on the ground, you could feel this very strong uneasiness in the pit of your stomach right just to say the least and as we get closer and closer to the actual um uh, i don't know site if you will um that's that feeling it increases and gets more and more intense um and you know i i find it funny how you'll hear people in our day talk about oh if i was during slavery times i wouldn't woo 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 i would go for that or i would right that all sounds good until you're on those grounds right um, I've always, my heroes have always been folks who are rebellious, right? I, I looked into folks like Nat Turner, to, to Denmark Vesey, to Gabriel Prosser, those who were enslaved, but they rebelled against that situation and tried to get others free, Harriet Tubman, right? So the first place that, the, the first comportment of the dungeon that we go to is for the males who were rebellious, right? So naturally my thought process is, well, oh shit, with this, if I were in this times, this is where I would end up, right? Yeah. I'm 6'2". So to get into the space, I literally had to like bend over and I'm, I'm walking, you know, like that. So this is how like small it was. But as you get in, it, it, it opens up. Um, it's very dark. And one of the first things that they do is they close the door behind us, right? So then it really gets dark. And they asked for us to feel on the wall. So you feel on the wall and it's concrete, right? But you feel these indentations in the concrete. And he asked us, the tour guide, do you feel the indentations? I'm like, yeah. And he says, those indentations come from the shackles of the enslaved rubbing up against these steel, or sorry, these concrete slabs to try to free themselves. Okay. They turn on like some lights and he asked us to look at the bottom of the wall and you see like a demarcation. So where it's like gray on top and then like a brownish color on the bottom, right? And he says, do y'all notice where the change in the color of the wall is? Like, yeah. Where that comes from 
is years upon years of defecation and piss on that wall because there's no where for you to go to the bathroom. There's no, they don't offer you the humanity to relieve yourself in a way that's civilized. So you just have to go on the wall, right? The smell of that space, like still just talking about it, I could smell it, right? Um, the last thing that we visit is the women's um, compartment for the women who refuse to be raped. Now, it's right on the coast of the Atlantic. So where the castles, they call it a castle. So where it's looking over is literally the Atlantic Ocean and they have cannons facing the Atlantic Ocean. So in case someone tried to you know, invade, they would shoot the can cannons at them. And what I noticed as we're kind of like going through um, the castle, there's cannonballs all over the space, everywhere. You see cannonballs, piles of cannonballs. And then we get into the women's dungeon. And um, I noticed more cannonballs. And he kind of explains the process of this space is for the women who refuse to be raped. And this is where they'll be forced into consent to rape. And he points out the cannonballs and they're about 25 to 30 pounds. And he says, what they would be forced to do is hold the cannonballs above their head. And as long as they hold it above their head, they're not allowing themselves to be raped, right? But how long can you hold 30 pounds above your head? It's not going to be forever, right? So eventually you're going to succumb to that weight. And when you put that weight down, when you put that cannonball down, you have now consented your body to the enslaver, right? So this is what happens before they get on the boat, right? So now you're chained up on a boat, on the bottom of a boat, right? Not knowing what the fuck is going on. Don't know where they're taking you to or the purpose, or the purpose of, where they're taking you, of why they're taking you where they're taking you, right? But you know what you just experienced, you know? If you're a woman, you know that if I put that cannonball down, what would happen to me, right? And, and, and let's just say possibly you become impregnant from that experience, right? So no, I don't know what's to come, but I know what I've just endured and I'd rather not go through that. So I'm gonna jump off of this ledge. I'm gonna throw my baby off of this ship just because they may have more chance of surviving. They more have more chance of success. They more have, they may have more chance of humanity than what I've endured and what's to come, you know? So I would have to say, yeah, it's that bad, you know? Um, there's a book that I've read called uh, School Clothes, and it talks about this cat named, I believe his name is Uncle Remus, and he says that he grew up on a plantation in Texas, and his granddaughter talks about how his he's blind, right? because his enslaver poured acid in his eyes because he got caught reading multiple times. And the purpose of him having acid poured in his eyes is A, to ensure he never tries to read again, but B, to ensure that those who know him know not to try to read again because this will be the outcome. So I, I would say, yeah, it was that bad. And, and I hate to provide such a... Um, morbid depiction of the reality that was enslavement, right? But that's the reality of it. You know, um, on the other half of our country, they're trying to say that that institution was beneficial to Black folks. I vehemently disagree, right? No state of being that renders you inhuman and subjects you to the behavior of someone who was inhuman is beneficial for that individual, right? Like to have a family literally torn apart just so you can make profit off of that family that can't benefit that individual in no way, right? Nor that family, you know? To set up a system to where the biggest, fastest, and strongest male, the biggest, fastest, and strongest female 
are put together and forced to mate so you can have the biggest and fastest and strongest baby so you can have the biggest, fastest and strongest worker, right? That can't be good for those people. When you eradicate a family structure, right? Whether it be through violence, whether it be through separation of sale, right? Whether it be through just the death of the overwork, right? And then you turn around and wonder why that same group of people can't maintain a family structure, right? When you do things like to ensure that you receive welfare, the father must be outside the home, right? Like these are, are the real ramifications of that institution that still reverberate to this day, you know? So yeah, I, I would definitely say it was that bad. Um, Other questions, comments, concerns? Real quick, I'm sorry. Uh, what was that? 323910. Can you please state who you are? I'll let you in, but I didn't, I didn't know. I'm assuming you're part of the class, but... Adelia, it looks like you're talking, but we can't hear you. Is that you? If that's you, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, bet, bet. All right, thank you. All right, um, so let me jump into the lecture with the time that we have left. Um, is there any other questions, comments, or concerns before we jump into that? No, all right. So what you all read is from Ngugi Wa Thiango. Um, the text is called Decolonizing the, Decolonizing the Mind. The politics of uh, African literature, sorry, the politics of language in African literature. Uh, you read the first um, chapter of the text. Um, looking at the first page of the first chapter, towards the bottom of the first paragraph, it states the choice of language and the use to which language is put is central to a people's definition of themselves in relation to their natural and social environment. Indeed, in relation to the entire universe. Hence, language has always been at the heart of two contending social forces in Africa, in the in the Africa of the 20th century, right? So one, he's providing you the stakes of the importance of language, right? For people to be able to define themselves, language is central to that, right? And, and, I, and I think for a lot of you dual language speakers, you understand that, right? You understand the um, the shame, if you will, for those who don't speak the language, right? Whether it's fair or not, right? Those who don't speak the language are looked at a little bit different, right? Because they have been removed to some extent from the, the cultural essence, right? This is what he's talking about. Um, He says the contention started, and he talks about like these two contending social forces in Africa, right? And he's centering, he's centering this around language, but he goes on to say, the contention started a hundred years ago when in 1884, the capitalist powers of Europe sat in Berlin and carved out the entire continent with a multiplicity of people, cultures, and languages into different colonies. And what he's talking about there is the Berlin Conference, right? The Berlin Conference of 1884, when the European powers um, sat down in Berlin, they met and say, okay, France, you'll have um, what we now know as Togo and Benin and Senegal, right? Um, Congo, that will be taken over by, um, by the, um, Belgium, right? And this is how each country of Europe determined what portion of Africa they would take over. This is the Berlin Conference. So he says, this is where that, that, that contention, this is where that battle begins, right? He continues on the next page, African countries as colonies and even today as neo-colonies came to be defined and to define themselves in terms of language of Europe, English speaking, French speaking, or Portuguese speaking African countries, right? So this is where you'll get terms like Anglophone, African countries. So for example, Ghana, where I went, they're an Anglophone African country, meaning they predominantly speak English because of, their, of them being a British colony, okay? Um, so for example, French, they're a Frank, sorry, um, Senegal, they're a Francophone country because they were colonized by the French and they speak French. Right. So this is where he's saying they're being classified by these languages. 
right? So no more is it about me being Wolof uh, or me speaking a kind, but I'm a Francophone African, so I speak French, right? I'm more dignified because I'm an Anglophone speaking African and I speak English, right? So this begins the way they begin to identify themselves. Um, before I move on, I, I just wanna make sure, who is unfamiliar or who does not understand what the term colonialism means? Because it's important to understand what the argument is here. Everybody's good with colonialism? Okay. Um, unfortunately, right, writers who should have been mapping paths out that linguistic encirclement of their contention of their contention also became uh, also came to be identified, or sorry, also came to be defined and to define themselves in terms of language of the imperialists, right? So he says, as writers, as African thinkers, we should have been writing our way out of that confinement, right? We should have been using our literature to break out of these modes of being Anglophone, of being Francophone, et cetera, et cetera. But instead, we further situated ourselves within these imposed linguistic forms of expression, right? And he says, it gets so absurd, it produces things like a conference of African writers of English expression. I'm going to write that, read that to you one more time, right? A conference of African writers of English expression. So these are all authors who are of African descent, right? Who come out of Africa, but the only way that you could attend this conference as an African individual is to write your stories, tell your truths in English. Right? And he says that's a contradiction. I want you also to think back to last week or the week before in the work of Maladoma Somme. And he says that to translate anything, right, is to give it a certain level of violence, a certain level of harm is done when any form of translation is made. Right. And here in Google, you're saying it has gotten so absurd that we're even giving conferences for folks who are African, but they can only attend the conference if they speak English. And he goes on to say, right, that um, it's so crazy that we have people who are world renowned poets, world renowned professors, right? But they can't attend the conference because their poetry and their intellectual production is done in the African language. But a student who hasn't even obtained their PhD yet is able to attend the conference because they do their writing in English, right? So that's like the equivalent of me because I, me having a PhD, right, um, being well published, right, and well famous for my work. But I can't go to the conference because all of my work is in Swahili, right? But Jay, who hasn't graduated yet, but does some really dope poetry, but it's in English, so he gets invited to the conference, right? And no slight on Jay, but his, his credentials don't match my credentials, right? I'm his professor. But only because Jay speaks in or does his work in English, that provides him access. And this is the contradiction that Ngugi is pointing out, right? Um, I'm looking at page seven, um, towards the bottom of the page, uh, one of the what, second to last paragraphs. He says, see the paradox. The possibility of using mother tongues to provoke a tone of levity in phrases like a dreadful betrayal, and a guilty feeling, but that of foreign languages produces a categorical positive embrace. What Abiche himself 10 years later would describe as this fatalistic logic of the unassailable position of English in our literature, right? So he's, he's pointing out the work or, or uh, he's critiquing this work of this idea from Chinua Achibe, who was a famous African writer who wrote the book, um, Things Fall Apart. Right. And he's saying that he has this fatalistic logic that, you know, English is going to be the world's language. So why not produce in English? Right. Why limit the scope of my work to just those who can speak my language? 
right? Like if I'm gonna write a book and I'm, I'm gonna get this book published and I'm gonna get paid for this work, I want everybody to read that shit, right? Not just those who could speak the specific language. And eventually English is gonna be a global language. So why fight it is what Achibe is arguing. But Gooey's like, hold on, man. There's a there's something to being able to express things in your own language, right? Um, let me see. I want to jump into that cultural bomb. So he talks about the cultural bomb, and and I think Kevin provided us like a very spot on um definition of what the cultural bomb is and what the cultural bomb does. But I, I want to not leave it so abstract, right? And I, I want to like kind of personalize it to you all. Um, and this could be done from a multiplicity of ways. But if this is about language, right, we'll, we'll leave it to where it's at. Um, and I know that the dual language speakers could understand this without, you know, very much contemplation. Um, but it's the same, it's, it's the same sense of, you may speak Spanish in your home, right? But when you go out in public, you make sure to leave the Spanish at home, right? And it may even be to where your parents are telling you or encouraging you, you know, mm, let's not do that out here, but that's for in the house conversation. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? This, this, this is the thing. Um, to, to a certain extent, right? Um, and... I think I asked a few weeks ago how many of y'all were uh, dual language speakers. And I asked Jay and Eric, were you dual language speakers? And y'all said no. And I said, well, y'all speak what they call African-American vernacular, right? So that's a form of dual language. And I would also argue within that, your parents may tell you, hey man, don't be talking that Ebonic shit out in public, right? It, it, it's cool at the house, but when you go out in, in, in public, use your professional voice, right? That's the effect of the cultural bomb. It's saying that how you operate in the spaces of comfort is not acceptable in the out, in the public sphere. This is why you're asked at times to leave that part of you at home. Does that make sense? Because if not, why would you not speak Spanish wherever you want to go or wherever you're at? Uh, Fabian, go ahead. Um, I have a question. So in in regards to the to the cultural bomb, mm -hmm. um, would you say has it had? Would you say has it gone better or gotten worse over the over the years? Um, I think it evolved. I think it evolved, and it's um, it plays out a little differently. Right. Um, an example of how it's evolved. Have you heard of the term code switching? Is that a familiar term to y'all? Eric, can you kind of explain to us what code switching is? Um, <clears throat> from what I know, code switching is like essentially what um, you stated before, like when you're going to different settings, especially like professional settings, like when you go to work, um, you tend to use more of a professional um voice or professional like speaking tone um that's different from how you usually speak so that's one example of it absolutely right so i talk to you like this on a regular basis but when i go into work hey yes sir my name is amiri manziwi and i'm here to be your professor today right that's because that is deemed more professional right um it may code switching may be even in the way that you dress right putting on a suit and tie because that's deemed special exception, oh, sorry, acceptable in this certain space. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Also kind of like with like family members or like um, certain like um, things, cause we code switch when it's like a funeral, a wedding, all this and that. But with like family members, like for example, like I dress like whatever, however I want to, but if I'm like with going with like family or like grandma or whatnot, I dress kind of like more, like covered a little bit like you know what I mean like I don't dress my style I dress a different style with her because that's not how they were raised right. and and I think encoded in these switches right is um this form of acceptability politic or respectability politic or both 
right? Because you don't want to make this, you don't want to draw a certain type of attention to yourself. So let me kind of boot present myself in this way. And, and and like, let's get to the bottom of what it is. It's really a survival tactic, right? Um, and, I, and I think one of the most long lasting and detrimental code switches that African people had to embark upon was the code switch to present themselves as dumb. Say it one more time. Code switching to present themselves as dumb. Right. And you're like, what the fuck that mean? But think about it. If you're in a plantation society to where your labor and yourself goes to the benefit of someone else. How much benefit does it for you to be known as the smartest person in the room? Right. One, you're going to be posed as a threat because if you ain't supposed to read how you know all that shit. Where are you getting that information from? Right. And then two, if you are as smart as you think you are, you better use them intelligence to make me more money, right? So instead of presenting my intelligence or furthermore, presenting the intelligence of my child, right? I'm gonna dumb that down. Cause I don't want the enslaver to know how smart my child is. Cause what are you gonna do? Take it, sell it, put it to work, right? So I'm gonna code switch and present myself to be dumb. It's how you get these false messages that to be smart in school is to act white, right? It's an after effect of code switching for so long as a means of survival that you got the, the message messed up. This is why I say one of the most detrimental and lasting negative effects of a code switch for black folks is the need to present yourself as dumb, right? But I think back to um, this notion of the cultural bomb and how it annihilates your ability to believe in yourself. You got another one. And, and, and it's kind of, it's, I appreciate that it's not as prevalent as it was in my day growing up, right? But when I was growing up, you had like the, the S-curl cats, right? The cats with the, the wavy hair, they put the perm in their hair to make it curly, right? That's an annihilation in your natural belief in self. Because what it says is, yo, the way the hair my grow, the way my hair grow out of its head, it ain't good enough. It's not acceptable, right? So I'm gonna put this chemical in my hair to make it look straight, to make it look like their hair, right? For those who are familiar with the story of Malcolm X, he talks about conking his hair, which is really uh, popular, was really popular back in the early um, 40s, right? And really it, it has several iterations of that. But it's this idea of putting this product in your hair to make your hair look like white folks. That's an effect of the cultural bomb, right? Thank God we went through the black power era to where we got rid of that process hair and, and the Afro begins to take a precedent and it resituates a pride in our natural self, right? That's an attempt to undo the effects of the cultural bomb. But Cultural bombs play out in so many various ways. Music. <laughs> Go ahead, Gavin. Like holidays, for example, like um, 4th of July, Labor Day, um, I guess Christmas with like cr Christianity and all that. I'm not saying like, oh, Christmas is bad, but like, you know, like it's kind of like, there's just, and it's like, it just like whiplashes you with like a culture that's not yours. So to your point, Kevin, right? How many of y'all celebrate Kwanzaa? How many of y'all heard about Kwanzaa? You feel me? So like, especially for the black folks, right? That's a cultural bomb. But I, if I were to ask you if you participate in Christmas, y'all all saying, yeah. So why is it that Christmas gets an elevated status above Kwanzaa, which celebrates your culture, right? That's the cultural bond. It's the inability to believe in yourself. Economic cultural bond. It's one of the reasons that black businesses have a problem. Hear me out, right? Folks who would all, who would normally 
go to a black business won't go there because they don't think the product is as good. This is the thing. Oh, the service is bad. Oh, why are you charging me that much for that product? But you would go play that very same price somewhere else because inherently you believe that they're offering you something worse just because they're Black. That's a byproduct of the cultural bomb and that plays out in the economic playing field, right? So that's why I say like, this is so vast in the way that this thing plays out is really, I wanted to kind of take a moment to like sit in that, to help you understand what Google is trying to get you to think about. Because yeah, it, you can think about it in the terms of language, that's one arena where it plays out, but it plays out in everything. And it's not just those out there in Africa who are dealing with this, we deal with this here. Go ahead, Kevin. Like also with like economic and all that, but it's also in political stance too. So like, even if like you go to like court or something, if you're a person of culture, they're like, no, you're you're guilty. Like they like try to like bias it towards like, oh, you're either guilty or like, I guess you're innocent, but you're still gonna have to get a punishment. And it'd be us who do it, right? Like, like, like check this out. The worst police is the black, for us, the black cop. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna have a worse interaction with a black cop just because they have bought into the sister, the systematic story of who we are. And they're gonna play that out in their interaction with us. The cultural bond, right? Um, we'll leave the remaining time. Go, go ahead, Ernesto. Uh, um, when you were talking about cultural bonds, um, something clicked into my head. So you were talking about how Malcolm X and it reminded me of the movie right away where, like you said, he would use products because of his hair and all that. It reminded me of something that my stepbrother said at some point because when we were younger, so he comes like off as half Mexican, half African. So he's never like very, like his dad wasn't there. So he wasn't very close with his dad's side, the African side, but he was close to more of the Mexican side. So he told me not too long ago about how when we were younger growing up in the entertainment version of Culture Bond, I guess, he always saw like Justin Bieber and like all these other like white, you know, mostly white entertainment, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he would always tell me, he's like, man, you know how tempted I was to just straighten my hair out? Like, I really didn't like my hair. And I told him, I was like, oh, I was like, why didn't you? Like, I mean, do you still want to do it? Like, it's your choice now. I don't really care. He's like, no, like, it's crazy because back then when we were younger, we were like, I don't know, five, seven, eight. We saw so much just, oh, you had to be white. Because at some point in my time, I wanted to be white. Like, I really believed it. Because even in elementary, they made you believe it. Like, they told you, oh, you were born here. You have paperwork. You're white. Like, you're not, you're not from your homeland you're nothing part of the motherland like you're not even close and it's so crazy because i don't really see that now at least at least now because now more and more like i'll point it out but even my little siblings will tell me they're like oh yeah like we we see mostly just you know white people this now like oh that's crazy because i've never really thought about it until now this point now that we're getting older yeah you bring up a good point and that's so like so what it makes me think about is like Telemundo, right? Now, I, I don't watch that shit a lot, but I do know that there are a lot more darker skinned Mexicans in Mexico than with Telemundo show, right? Like I know like on them novellas and shit, like that's not the full representation of what South America is like, Mexico is like. Brazil, same thing, right? When they show Brazilian folks, they're not showing the folks in, 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 in the, um, not the, what's they call it in, the, in Brazil? Um, I forget the term, but like they're ghettos, right? They don't show them. They only show this one European depiction of who a Brazilian is, right? And that is, again, a byproduct of the cultural bomb. You don't see yourself. So you don't see the value in yourself. Go ahead, Kevin. And even with like little kid toys, because I remember, um, I remember I would get my like little niece like a birthday gift for her. And she's like, I want a Barbie. And I was like, oh, let me try to get like a cultural one for her. And I go to the Barbie section, just white, white. And you only see like, like one black Barbie, one Mexican Barbie. Like it's just, barely, you can barely see it. Yeah, it's pervasive, it's everywhere. 
right? And I, I think you bring a really good point. Uh, actually, both you and Ernesto also, right? Like how it plays out very young, how it plays out in the youth's mind, right? Um, and then you wonder, shit, have y'all seen Sammy Sosa? Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say Sammy Sosa? One second. Coach for Bob. You feel me? This is what he used to look like. This ghoulish looking vampire creature that he turned himself into is what he looks like now, right? Because he doesn't have a value in his dark skin, right? It's cultural bond. Where's he from? Uh, Cuba. Um, shit. Look at, look at her now. Like, I'm sorry, right. See her in this photo, like, look at, right? Trying to find a more recent photo of her. Even you look here, there's a drastic difference, but she looks more lighter now than she does in that photo. Let me see something. Anyway, but you get my point, right? Anyway, yeah, this is all over. This is all throughout Jamaica. This is all throughout um, West Africa. This phenomenon of skin bleaching, right? People like using very harmful products on their skin to lighten the complexion of their skin. It's cultural bond. Um, so with the time left, let's open it up for the fishbowl. Uh, we could talk about the breakout group questions. You could talk about your journal. Uh, you could talk about the lecture um, twice per semester, um, one time to pass. Would anyone like to volunteer? I can go. Okay, we got Kevin, Amanda, and Eric. Anyone else like to volunteer? All right. Um, all right, perfect. Marlene, I got you as well. Who would like to start us off? Oh, Abigail, I got you. I can go. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go back to like the little culture bomb thing. Um, so I'd be like, uh, like everyone uses TikTok. Like we all use TikTok. I was scrolling on TikTok and I'm like minding my own business. And you know, like how now TikTok has like a shot feature. I would be scrolling on TikTok and I get this ad where it's skin bleaching. It's like a skin bleaching soap that bleaches your skin. And I was like. I'm not interested in this. Like, why is it like recommending it to me? And you look at the comments and people are like, oh my God, I would love to, I would love to use this product and all this and that. And it's like kind of scary because it's like, you're basically just like feeding into it instead of like fighting against it, you're feeding into it. And it's kind of like a scary like thing that's like, oh, this is what America is now. Like we all want to be like your average white person chilling with blonde hair, blue eyes, and chilling on the beach in Malibu. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Um, who's next? We have Eric, Marlene, and Abigail. Um, so I do kind of want to also um, add on to the culture bomb thing, especially to what Kevin mentioned um, earlier in the lecture. Um, there was, um, in the text, there was um, a quote that was like, right um under talking about like the effects of the cultural bomb and um it said um it makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement and it makes them want to distance themselves from that wasteland it makes them want to identify with that which is furthest removed from themselves and um in my critical race theory class we just uh, my professor mentioned the um the self-fulfilling pros uh, prophecy and um, I think that's like, a, this is like a common experience for people of culture where like this erasing of our history, um, like strengthens the influence of these like European ideals. And like, it therefore like leads to us as individuals beginning to like agree with these false prejudices and stereotypes that are against us, even though it's like, 
it's like we're our own worst enemy because even though they're against us, we do start to believe them because we hear them so much in society because those European ideals are, are pushed um, so much. And so that damages our own cultural identity. So, yeah. Great call out, Eric. Thank, Thank you. you. We have Abigail and Amanda. Oh, sorry, Abigail and Marlene. Can you hear me? Oh. Yeah. Should I go? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to read some of my journal. Um, I wrote that the reading talks about the importance of language and how it conveys culture. And the choice of language, according to the author, divine, defines uh, someone's natural and social environment. And the writer wanted to, the writer would like African ideas, philosophy, and folklore to be used to the fullest extent possible. Perfect. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, who's next? I can go ahead. So in the reading, it was talking about how language was an important factor in someone's like individual uh, life. And it was talking how it was the soul of a prisoner. And back to cultural bombing, my first language is Spanish. My whole family speaks Spanish, my older sister, my mom, my dad, except my brother, because he was taught to learn English and my mom refused to teach him Spanish because of the racism we dealt with speaking Spanish earlier here. Um, I remember I used to go to this really white school and there was this little white boy who would always tell the teacher that I was picking on him, but I was like, like smaller than him. I was tanner than him. I couldn't speak English that well. And I would always just sitting on the bench because he would always tell on me. And now my brother can't really embrace the culture that we have as he should be doing. He can't speak Spanish to my relatives. It's so hard for him. They have to learn English to speak to him. And it's really sad to see how he can't involve himself within us. And he has told me that he feels more different than us. And it just saddens me how a lot of people go through this and how cultural bombing is a really real and tough situation for a lot of individuals who go through it. Good call out, Abigail. And I thank you for, um, you know, being vulnerable and kind of personalizing and telling us your story as it pertains to the impact of cultural bomb on your family. Um, Marlene, he, uh, it's on you. Um, I would just make, like to make a comment on how, like, for example, for code switching, like how Kevin said, based on certain occasions or the people you're surrounded, like your relatives or like people you care about, I guess, you're brought up or you're taught that, oh, you should accommodate, like, oh, how they are raised, their beliefs, for example. Like, with my grandparents, they're very religious, and they're brought up, but like, oh, they always say, back in my day, so and so and so. So you're, I wouldn't say you're accommodated, but you're conditioned to act a certain way around these certain people to accommodate, oh, what they think is right. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point. Like, I think also, like, there's that distinction between doing something out of respect and doing something because you don't va you don't value or your true self is not being valued. I think that's more. It's not that you don't value it. It's those around don't value, right? Um, I don't think in terms of respect, right? Like, so for example, like I cuss, right? Like, but in certain spaces, I won't do that because that's going to be deemed disrespectful. It doesn't mean that I see myself less than, right? So I, I think also what you're bringing up is like this distinction between respect norms, right? And and then the other side of the coin, which is the, the code switching because you're being devalued. So here's your assignment, the time that we have left. On top of the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Fabian. Um, do you have room for one more fishbowl? I actually have a story. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we I actually, um, what's it called? We use code switching a lot. Well, where I, where I'm at, because um there was this actual incident. So, um it was like nighttime. It was uh me, my mom, and my brother and his girlfriend. So we went to the beach. Blah blah blah. We were just walking around. My brother and his girlfriend went off, and then me and my mom were just sitting down, because we were waiting for my sister, and my cousin to pull up, and. So we don't, we speak Spanish a lot in the house, like English and Spanish, but you hear a lot of Spanish. 
Um, and usually when we leave the house, I notice that we don't really speak a lot of uh, Spanish. And what that story was building into. So uh, back to the beach, um, we were just sitting outside and my sister and my mom, you know, they're speaking to each other in Spanish, blah, blah, blah. And like, there's, we, we really don't get any encounters at all. But um, the, there was a white lady there and like we were sitting next to their house we, we were in a public spot basically uh sitting on um like a stone wall and um this this white lady she never she never approached us when we were speaking english none, none, none of that and the moment we started speaking spanish she like kind of eyed her way towards us and like a little bit more time passes she comes up to us and she starts making a whole like a whole scene blah 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 how, oh, you guys shouldn't be here. It's private property, even though we were like on the sidewalk. It's like a public spot. And blah, blah, blah. Well, we did, really didn't know the reason as to why, but my mom pretty much figured it out because we were talking Spanish. So, yeah, we use code switching a lot. Um, we try to refrain from speaking Spanish outside the house, unless it's like, say, for example, I go to a Mexican market, then it's okay, you know? So, a lot of code switching there. Thank you, Fabian, because this is a, a great segue into your assignment, right? And on top of your reading that you have to do, um, and I'm going to give you a week. We'll talk about this next Monday. But with the precaution, right? Don't get fired. Don't get fucked up. That's your precaution. But don't code switch. When you normally would code switch, don't, right? But when you do that, do two things. One, see, be very attentive to how those around you are responding to you not code switching, right? Like pay attention to that. But then also pay attention to how you feel by just being your pure and authentic self. But again, right? Like, like don't do nothing to get yourself fired and don't do nothing and put yourself in a, in a position of harm, right? But try to play with pushing that boundary as much as you can um, because what I found in my experiences, um, one or two things happen. One, the outside world respects you for being yourself and it kind of encourages them to be their self. And I think once you kind of tap into that, you'll realize that it's okay to be your pure and authentic self wherever you go. It's a liberation, it's a liberating sense that comes with just being yourself. And knowing that that's okay, right? Knowing that to be anything less than that is to devalue who I am, right? Like the creator, the ancestors, they made you this way for a very special and specified reason. Even the things that you may think is awkward, right? Like those things are vitally important. And to diminish that, to try to turn that light down, right? It serves you no good, and it serves the people who you have been placed here for, it serves them no good either, right? You've been placed here to empower and positively impact other people's lives at some capacity, right? And you're not going to be able to fully do that by trying to make someone else feel comfortable. Because this is why we code switch, right? Whether it be out of fear, but really what it gets down to is not making someone else feel uncomfortable. Why not be your divine self because someone else is uncomfortable? So this is your assignment. We'll talk about it next Monday. Um, for next week's, for sorry, not next week, for Wednesday's class. Um, did I, shit, nah, I did. I'm sorry, I'll give you one second. I just want to point to y'all the reading. Um, And for next week, okay, we're going into, mm, you know, I want to kind of keep these together. Shit. Okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go into Tony Morrison. So I'm going to point it out to you. So for Wednesday, please read Playing in the Dark by Tony Morrison. Uh, reason being, I want to, I want to get into this as one complete reading, right? So well, don't worry about 
Glee Salt for this Wednesday, jump into Toni Morrison playing in the dark. So come prepare to discuss this on Wednesday. Toni Morrison's playing in the dark, the second reading of week seven. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. And I think once you read it and thinking about what Glee Salt is, sorry, thinking about what and Googie is talking about and what we've discussed today, it will kind of complement each, each other very well, okay? Um, other than that, you all, if no one has